So here's your gas cloud, and this is space next to it. And by definition, a gas is made up of molecules that are not rigidly bound to each other. Because if, if you have molecules rigidly bound to each other, that's a solid. And if they're bound but sliding around, that's a liquid. And then when they break free completely, that's a gas, right? So we have all these molecules of gas bouncing around inside the cloud. Now, they move a little bit, and they immediately run into a neighbor. They collide. And so then they bounce off in a different direction. So in here, all the gas is bouncing off of their neighbors, and no problem. That's, that just happens. Think about, though, the very outmost layer of gas molecules here. Now, since they're all going in random directions, half of them will be going in some direction that's inward, whether straight in or over here or over here or whatever. Those half are going to go inwards until they run into a neighbor and then bounce off and keep doing that. But half of them are going to have some variety of outward direction. Those don't have neighbors. Those go off into space, they don't hit anything, and they're gone. So the gas cloud is constantly losing the outermost layer of gas molecules. And of course, when one layer vanishes, that exposes the next one, which vanishes, which exposes the next one, and so on. Like peeling an onion until it's all gone, right? So left to its own devices, a gas cloud in space does not form stars. It dissipates. Gravity is at work here, but gravity is weak compared to gas pressure, which is much stronger, drives the molecules apart, the gas cloud goes away. Okay, it seems that Spike Saris has a very weird view of, a very non-traditional view of uh, what gas clouds are like in space. He seems to think that space is a perfect vacuum, and that you have a gas cloud that's in this perfect vacuum, and that at the top of the cloud, the molecules are, half the molecules are going up and half are going down, and the ones that are going up just go on forever and never come back. And so you, you, his basic idea, his basic point is that you're going to lose all the gas molecules through this process, which is called evaporation, before the gas collapses into a star. Okay, now there's several things wrong with this. Okay, first, I mean, let's, let's first ignore the fact that space is not a perfect vacuum, and let's assume that a gas cloud is, in fact, in a perfect vacuum, and that it has edges. He's ignoring the gravity of the cloud, in, in the sense that the, the, the cloud, if you think of it as a sphere, it has some mass m and some radius r, and so it generates a gravitational field that's just like the field of a planet of mass m and radius r. And in particular, it has an escape velocity, square root of 2gm over r, where g is Newton's constant, m is the mass of the gas, and r is the radius of the gas. So, the first problem with what he's saying, the first problem with what he's, with his idea is that most of the molecules at the top of the cloud are not going to be moving faster than the escape velocity. They're all moving at different speeds because the gas is made out of molecules moving at different speeds in different directions. But the, the, so if, the, if a molecule is not moving faster than the escape velocity, when it reaches the top of the cloud, it's going to go up and it's going to come back down. You know, if you throw something in the air, it doesn't just keep going up, it comes back down. So all the molecules that were moving up are just going to be pulled back by the gravity of the cloud. Only the, the molecules that happen to be moving faster than the escape velocity are, are going to be the ones that is, you know, keep going and never come back. Okay, now, but the, the, the fraction of molecules that are moving faster than the escape velocity is really tiny. So, you, so this, process of, um, this process of losing gas, or losing molecules, which is called evaporation, is a very slow process. Okay, now, uh, another, and we'll quantify that later. Another problem is that he completely ignores the actual structure of molecular, of clouds in space. First off, space is not a vacuum. It's not empty. The space between the stars is filled with gas and dust. There's this diffuse background of gas and dust, and then embedded within that are what we would call the clouds, the clouds of gas. What we think of as clouds of gas and dust are really high-density regions in a sort of ambient, average density background. That's part of the galaxy. And when, when astronomers started measuring the density of gas in space, they found that the clouds have a hierarchical structure. Okay, so, so you have the diffuse 
you know, the background interstellar medium. Interstellar medium is the gas and dust between the stars. Then, for, then the clouds themselves are organized as follows. On the largest scale, you have a giant molecular cloud, which is about 150 light years across, and it has something like 100,000 solar masses of gas. But its density is uh, about 20 times the density of the background. Then, embedded within the giant molecular cloud, you have even you have subclouds called clumps. These are higher density regions within the giant molecular cloud. They are they have a higher density, so their their density is something like 250 times the density of the of the diffuse ISM. And within the clumps, you have the highest density regions of all, which are called cores or dense cores. Okay, and they're hundreds to thousands of times more dense than the diffuse interstellar medium. Okay, so this is the actual structure of clouds in space. Okay, and so he, he seems to think that clouds actually have edges where, you know, that separate the cloud from outside the cloud. And, you know, maybe it's because we draw them with edges, because we have to. You, you, can't draw, you can't draw a cloud without an edge because what you're drawing is the edge. But the edges are imaginary in the sense that the, the density in the ISM doesn't, you know, abruptly change from the density in the ISM to the density in the GMC. It's, it's a smooth transition. The density in the ISM gradually increases until you know, it, it reaches the density of the giant molecular cloud. And same thing with the clumps and the cores. Okay? So it, there's no abrupt discontinuities in the density. All right? So keep that in mind. So, but he does have a point. Because even though, well, first off, he was saying that um, you know, he was saying that if, if, a, if a gas molecule is here and it moves up, then there's nothing out here for it to hit to make it come back down. Okay, so he's wrong about that because there is an interstellar medium that has gas and dust so that if a molecule was to move outward, uh, then it would come back down. And then it, it, it might hit something out here and make it come back down. <clears throat> Even, but... Um, but he, he does have a, there's, there's some little kernel of sense in the crazy thing he said. Because this process, can, this process where a gas cloud loses molecules because some of the molecules at the edge are moving faster than the escape velocity, that's a real thing that, that can happen. Okay, even though there's, there's no actual edge, you can define an edge. So, for example, you can define the edge to be the place where the density first starts decreasing below the average. Okay? So, if you do that, then, then you can have a, a well-defined edge. It's imaginary, but at least mathematically it's well-defined. Now, the thing, though, the thing, the thing is, at that edge, you know, half the molecules are moving up and half the molecules are moving down. So you're gonna, but most of the molecules that are moving up are not moving faster than the escape velocity. So they're just gonna come right back down because of the gravity. And, mo and even the ones that are moving faster than the escape velocity, they might hit one of the atoms and molecules out here and be forced back. But they might not because they could hit, you know, they could hit it and go off in some other direction. So the, the fact that there is some f tiny fraction of the molecules that are moving faster than the escape velocity, it does mean that over time the cloud is losing mass by this process. Okay? But it's, it's a very slow process because, mostly because there's just not that many atoms and molecules in the gas that are moving faster than the escape velocity. Okay, now we can quantify how, how important this evaporation process is by calculating the time it would take the cloud to completely evaporate, or the time scale over which evaporation removes a significant mass from the clouds. And each of these clouds, the GMC, the clump, and the core will have their own evaporation times because they have their own densities and stuff. All right, now, 
I have derived the formula for the evaporation time of a cloud in terms of, you know, its uh, basic properties of the um, gas cloud, like mass, radius, density, whatever. Okay, I can't derive it in this video. It involves calculus, but I will make a supplementary video where I justify this. Okay, now, <clears throat> and there's also a formula for escape velocity, which, which you know, that's just a basic formula. You, you, could, you could calculate the escape velocity at the edge of any of these objects by plugging in the mass of the object, which comes from here, and the radius of the object, which I put here. And by the way, I got these numbers from a textbook. From, uh, from a textbook called The Formation of Stars. And I know that not everyone's going to have access to the textbook, so I, I um, in the description part, I included a link to an annual review paper called Theory of Star Formation, where most of this is taken from. And so if you want, you can probably get these numbers from that. You can definitely get most of this discussion from that paper. Okay? And if the, for those of you that have access to the textbook, these numbers... Uh, each of these structures, the molecular cloud, the clump, and the core, and the diffuse ISM, the I took their properties from the textbook. So the, the mass density, the um, total mass, radius, and then I calculated the escape velocity with that formula. Okay, now let's talk about this, this thing here. So I derived the formula for the time it would take, a, the time scale over which a significant mass of these objects is lost in terms uh, due to this evaporation effect. And that's there. <clears throat> now, so then I, so uh, th I should say something about, so this, most of, most of these variables are about the, um, the overall properties of the cloud. Okay, so like the density of the cloud, the radius of the cloud, capital R, capital M is the mass of the cloud. Okay, Boltzmann's constant is K sub B, Newton's constant is G. Uh, but also uh, important in, in this case is the, Lowercase m is the mass per molecule in the cloud, which I took to be uh, 2.4 hydrogen masses, which for, comes from the textbook. And then also the radius of the molecules, <coughs> A comes in this formula for the de de evaporation, and I use this number here. So if you, if you take this formula and then you plug in the, the values, then you can calculate the evaporation time for each of these structures, giant molecular cloud, clump, and core. And I put them here. And the first thing you'll notice is that these numbers are ridiculous. Okay, this is the evaporation time in seconds. So like for a GMC, the evaporation time is uh, basically 10 to the 164. And for a clump, it's 10 to the 27 seconds. And then for a core, it's 10 to the 29 seconds. So these are enormously long time spans. Okay, the age of the universe is something like ten, four times ten to the seventeen seconds. So this is these are billions, tens of billions of times. These evaporation time scales are tens of billions of times longer than the age of the universe. But that's not what we're supposed to compare it to, because what Spike is saying is Spike is saying that this prevents star formation. The evaporation prevents star formation, and that would only be true if the formation. It, well, basically. It would only be true if the evaporation took place before the star formation. Or in other words, mathematically, if the time scale for evaporation is less than the time scale for star formation, then the gas will have evaporated before you can make a star. But if it's the other way around, if the time scale on which gravity compresses the gas into a star is less then the time scale that evaporation takes place on, then the gas will have collapsed into a star before it evaporated. And what astronomers usually use for the star formation time is the free fall time. So that's, that's the time it would take gravity to take a sphere of matter with density rho and compress it to a point if gravity was, <coughs> sorry, if gravity was the only force acting on it. And it's free fall time. And that's basically the time, you know, people use that as the time over which gravity turns gas into a star. It only depends on the density. So if you take the density of each of these structures, 
and you plug it into the free fall time formula, then you get this column here. So this is the free the star formation time in seconds. So you know the so the GMC is like 2.1 times 10 to 14 seconds, and the clump is 10 to the 14 seconds, and the core is 10 to the 12 seconds. What's important is the star the free fall time is way less than the evaporation time. And over here I've given you the ratio of the evaporation time to the free fall time. So for example, for the GMC, the ratio is 10 to the 149. Okay? Which means stars form 10 to the 40, 10 to the 149 times faster than evaporation takes place. <clears throat> or I guess you know it, it would be more correct to say the the time oh, the time it takes to evaporate a GMC, a giant black air cloud, is 10 to the 149 times longer than the time it would take gravity to turn it into a star. And similarly for the clump in the core. Okay, so like the clump. So in, in every case. The time scale for gravitational collapse is way less than the time scale for evaporation. And that's mostly because it's just very hard to find a molecule that's traveling faster than the escape velocity. I guess I should also say that for the temperature, I didn't put this up there, for the temperature I used 15 Kelvin for the GMC and 10 Kelvin for the core and clump. Those are the observed values. And that's basically why. Um, why evaporation takes forever is because at 10 Kelvin, that's 10 degrees above absolute zero, the molecules are barely moving. There's virtually no molecules that are moving faster than the escape velocity. So of course it's going to take forever for well, it's going to take forever for this evaporation to to uh, reduce the mass of the these structures. All right. And anyway, to to summarize it, the, the main point is. Spike is wrong to say that, I don't even know what he's trying to say, but he, it seems like he's saying that um, this, this effect of the, the atoms at the top of the cloud go into space, half of them moving up, half of them moving, going down, they go into space, and they don't come back. And that would cause the gas cloud to disperse before it can turn into a star. He's wrong to say that because, first off, the gas has gravity, which means that only the molecules that are traveling faster than the escape velocity can actually um, escape. The other ones are just going to come right back down. And the problem is at the cold temperatures of the gas, 10 Kelvin, 15 Kelvin, the, there's virtually no molecules or there's very few molecules traveling faster than the escape velocity. So only over very, very, very long periods of time are you going to, uh, you know, is this effect going to be important. But the importance of gravity takes place on much, the collapse time takes place on much shorter times. So in other words, star formation takes place so much faster than evaporation that by the time a star forms, before, before evaporation can even get started, the gas has already turned into a star. <clears throat>